Good day to everyone who joined us today. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join this IFSO webinar about the role of uh, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty in the management of people with obesity. And my name is Zahir Timi. I'm a bariatric surgeon at Spa Washington Hospital in the Northeast of England and Vice Chairman of the IFSO Communication Committee. I am extremely honored to have two top ESG experts presenting to us today. Uh, Professor Ayed al Kahtani is a bariatric uh, surgeon uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia. He is professor of bariatric and minimally invasive surgery, president of the Saudi Arabian Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, president of the Gulf Obesity Surgery Society, uh, director of the International Bariatric Club uh, in Middle East and Africa, and founder and CEO of New You Medical Center. Um, our um, other presenter is Professor Baram Abu Daya, uh, who is gastroenterologist from the US. He is professor of medicine. He is director of advanced endoscopy. He's associate research chair for innovation and assistant medical director for business development at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I'm also very honored to have a sterling panel with us today. Uh, Dr. Rachel Moore is a, a bariatric surgeon at the Denver Center for Bariatric Surgery, uh, the Rose Medical Center in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ricardo Cohen is a bariatric surgeon uh, from Brazil. He's the director um, of the Center of Treatment for Obesity and Diabetes uh, in the Oswald Cruz German Hospital in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and he's past president of IFSO Latin America. Dr. Nasreen Al-Faris is a bariatric physician uh, from Saudi Arabia um, at the Obesity Endocrine and Metabolic Metabolism Center. She is program director of the Obesity Medicine Fellowship at King Fahd uh, Medical City. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, just a reminder, this webinar is going to be recorded and it's going to be available on the IFSO Virtual Academy um, on Monday at the latest, and most likely it, it might be ready tomorrow. And, and also it's going to be available on the IFSO YouTube channel. Um, but please, uh, if you have any questions, add them to, to uh, the uh, a question, um, to, to uh, the question box at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we'll try to answer them after the two presentation. And um, without further delay, we are going to start with the presentation from uh, Professor Abu Daya. Um, is it possible to start the presentation? Thank you. Hello, dear colleagues. My name is Barham Abu Daya, and it's a pleasure to be participating in this IFSO webinar, uh, talking about endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, specifically focusing on the merit trial. Attached are my disclosures for the purposes of uh, this talk. So the, the goals for today is truly to discuss unmet needs in obesity and metabolic disease management. I'm going to give you an overview uh, on endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty and focus on the state of the literature, specifically as it pertains to the merit trial. And then hopefully end this with positioning ESG in the spectrum of obesity care. Where does ESG fit in that spectrum? So the unmet need is pretty clear. Uh, these are projections uh, for the prevalence of obesity by 2030. You could see a new color emerging on the map in the United States. That means we're going to be pushing prevalence of the disease in about 60% of the population, which is quite alarming. Mirroring this, the burden of uh, diseases associated or in the same pathophysiological pathway as excess adiposity, especially type 2 diabetes, is also on the rise. 37 million with type 2 diabetes and close to 100 million with pre-diabetes, the majority of them do not know that they have the disease. When it comes to managing type 2 diabetes, you could see that there's still a significant unmet need. These are trends from 2004 to 2020 uh, of adult 
patients in the United States managed medically for their type 2 diabetes, you could see about 50% of this cohort, despite advancement in medical therapy, do not achieve the goal uh, hemoglobin A1C of less than seven or adequate glycemic control. And part of this is we're not addressing the underlying cause of excess adiposity, and we're not targeting the GI tract as a potential therapeutic option for metabolic diseases such as uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes. So the theme for today's talk is pushing boundaries. And what are the boundaries that we're trying to push? We're trying to push this boundary between uh, non-interventional uh, or, or lifestyle modification and surgical intervention for the disease of excess adiposity. And the idea is we need to augment the spectrum of care and we need to add value, not just put interventions there, but put interventions with value to allow us to address the disease of obesity. And as we build the spectrum of care, we're going to highlight where ESG fits in that spectrum of care. What is ESG and what's its value proposition? As I said, there's a huge unmet need in obesity management, and ESG has unique value proposition in that it is organ sparing. It's a procedure done through the mouth. It is safe and effective, does not have long-term consequences to health. As far as we know, it does not seem to worsen reflux disease or, uh, or, 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 uh, or have macro or micronutrient efficiency. An important value is it minimally disrupts the patient uh, life. And we know compliance is a big part of the intervention. And ESG is a procedure that's done and, 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 and it could overcome some of the compliance issues that you could, we could see with medications uh, and uh, other interventions. So the, the procedure itself, uh, is uh, is uh, is a an endoscopic procedure, but before we talk about the procedure itself, it's very important to highlight that weight loss above ten percent is a dominant and significant strategy for the management of metabolic diseases. And that trial, while well, it has some limitations, illustrate that elegantly. In this trial, our colleagues uh, prospectively allocated patients to either low caloric diet or gastric bypass, and they match the weight loss to about 18% in both groups. And you could see dramatic and similar improvement in, in, in metabolic parameters, including the hyperinsulinemic, euglycemic pancreatic clamp, beta cell function, and, and body uh, composition and, uh, and visceral fat uh, content. So a weight loss in the neighborhood of 18% is sufficient to have significant metabolic improvement, and that's an important first principle uh, in this. So when we talk about ESG as a procedure, it's done using this device. It's called the overstitch. Uh, and with that device, you uh, intubate through the patient mouth in an, an outpatient procedure. Uh, and you're placing a series of uh, sutures along the greater curvature of the uh, stomach in order to shorten the stomach and tuberize its, uh, uh, its greater curvature. So now you have a shortened and, uh, and tuberized stomach as shown in this uh, animation. These anatomic alterations have physiological consequences because we know the stomach regulates appetite, and appetite is fundamentally regulated as the process of satiety and satiation. These are dynamic MRI images of the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty after it heals three months after, and you could see the shortened tuberized stomach you can see that the stomach is still fully vascularized and innervated. That's why it's a low pressure system, still peristalsing, but it's restricted reservoir with a small pouch in the fundus that accommodates 
food so you could terminate the meal early so it improves satiation and then it delays the gastric emptying without retarding the motor function of the stomach so you have increased satiety so it's it's working on on human appetite pathways uh, I would refer you to this publication that highlights uh, the physiology uh, of this uh, procedure published in gut and uh, and and details these uh, anatomic uh, manipulation and the resultant physiological changes in appetite pathways. Now, what's the state of the evidence? There's about 16,000 procedures in the peer-reviewed literature. Told serious adverse events rate of about 1.25%. Total body weight loss is about 17.5% at one year. Remember, the 18% I showed you in this New England Journal Medicine paper that was associated with significant metabolic improvement. So ESG is capable of reaching that endpoint at one year. The weight seems to be durable up to the three years horizon, as illustrated in this systematic review and pooling of the literature. Uh, the Lancet was a US-based multi-center randomized trial that in conjunction with the state of the evidence allowed the FDA to issue market clearance for the use of uh, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty using the Apollo uh, system for the management of obesity in patients with body mass index between 30 to 50 who have not been able to achieve or maintain weight loss through conservative measures. What is the LASA trial? The LASA trial included nine U.S. centers, both surgeons and gastroenterologists, in community practice and in academia, both experts and those who are novices or new to the procedure that learned the procedure during the trial. It randomized about 208 patients with a body mass index of about 36 to either ESG or moderate intensity lifestyle intervention. The primary endpoints were defined by societies. Both ASMBS and ASGE said, were an endoscopic procedure to be deemed clinically effective, we need to see 25% excess weight loss at one year with a delta from a lifestyle arm of 15%, and serious adverse events rate less than 5%. So that's where the, the outcome of the, the trial was predominantly powered meat. We took it a split step further to assess the durability uh, of uh, the intervention at two years and to investigate in a sub uh, population its impact on comorbidities such as hypertension, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and GERD. This is the first year of the trial. The blue is the ESG arm. The red is the moderate intensity lifestyle intervention. And you could see the society said get to 25% excess weight loss. We doubled that endpoint. We reached about 49.2%. The delta was supposed to be at 15 to deem it successful. The delta was 45%. 77% were responders to the procedure, achieving more than the primary endpoint or, or more than 25% excess weight loss with a total body weight loss in this cohort of responders of 16.3% as shown here. The trial was a crossover. Those who got ESG uh, or those who got lifestyle in year one crossed over to get ESG in year two. And those who got ESG were followed for an additional year to look at the durability of that intervention. Despite COVID hitting the second or affecting the second year of the trial, you could see those who crossed over achieved almost identical weight loss outcomes as those who got ESG in year one. And those who maintained the follow up in year two maintained the majority of their weight loss in year two. Now, this weight loss, which is not surprising, you get to this degree of weight loss, you're going to see significant metabolic improvement. Diabetes improved in 93% of the population, metabolic syndrome in 83% of the population, hypertension in 67% of the population, versus worsening, actually, in, 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 in the standard of care population. Remember, these were diabetics that were managed medically for their disease, and you could see through the, uh, through the duration of the trial, there's a significant percentage that worsened their metabolic diseases uh, in the standard of care arm. 
When we look at uh, objective measures of insulin resistance, uh, hemoglobin A1C, you could see significant improvements compared to standard of care. Similarly, improvement in the hepatic steatosis index, inflammatory marker, and visceral adiposity as measured by the waist to hip uh, ratio as shown here. So overall, the weight loss achieved was sufficient to have significant clinically mean meaningful improvement in metabolic diseases that were highlighted here. The procedure was quite safe. The society said less than 5% incidence of serious adverse events. We had 2% and these were not disasters. These were one case of perigastric abscess managed endoscopically, one case of upper GI bleed managed conservatively with a relook endoscopy, and one case of maladaptive eating behavior leading to malnutrition that necessitated, necessitated reversal or, or of the ESG endoscopically. So none of these complications required ICU stay, none of them required surgical intervention, and most of them resolved with no consequences. Six patients were hospitalized or 4% hospitalization rate to manage conservative accommodative symptoms in this trial. Now, the question is, is ESG durable? And the data is still evolving on the durability of the procedure, but this is comes from our colleague in Cornell, Dr. Shariha, that shows that in, in a population that is followed in a high quality program, the results are durable up to five years as demonstrated in the study. Our colleague in India, Dr. Bandari and Dr. Galvao, published their experience in India in a large cohort with good follow-up, 82% follow-up at four years, showing that in a, in a multidisciplinary program, the results are durable with a 17% or 17.7% total body weight loss at four years. Dr. Al-Ahtani will describe the study in his talk, so I'm not gonna belabor that, but that also demonstrated durability uh, uh, at three years. So the evolution of the evidence that in the context of a multidisciplinary high quality program, that the result you see with ESG is durable, at least in the midterm horizon. Now, this study is new, and this was just presented at Digestive Disease Week by uh, one of my uh, superb fellows, Dr. Gala. And this looked at commercial US experience. These are cases done clinically in the United States, large cohort, about, about 1,500 patients. And we looked at those with class one, class two, class three obesity. And an interesting pattern emerged. That the procedure was effective uh, and at one year, and actually in that paper, we will show that it was effective up to three years. But more importantly, when you look per obesity class, class one, two, or three, and this is the responder's rate as defined as achieving at least 15%, 15% total body weight loss. You could see that in class one, about half of the cohort gets to that threshold. In class two, about 60% of the cohort get to, the, uh, to that threshold. And in class three is the highest percentage, about two thirds of the cohort reach this clinically very meaningful 15% total body weight loss. When you look at 10%, the vast majority of the the, uh, the patients in any cohort reaches th this threshold. So now you have a poor oral, oral procedure that could apply to a wider spectrum of uh, obesity. That's why in the US it's approved for a body mass index between 30 and 50. Uh, now let's go back to the question or where do we position ESG in the spectrum of obesity care? There is no doubt that medications are getting really good. You could see with medications like trisipidide that we're gonna we're hitting this 15 to 20 percent total body weight loss. However, the weight loss that you see with an per oral outpatient endoscopic procedure is in par with 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 these medications. Now, the medications are getting better as far as efficacy, but also endoscopy is getting better as far as safety. 
medications have issues of non-compliance. Discontinuation and yo-yoing of the weight loss and weight gain is, is an issue. There is a percentage of serious adverse events and intolerance. But then what now when you superimpose that equation into a serious adverse event rate of ESG of about 1.2%, discontinuation of 0.5%, you could see that now we have emerging first-line therapies. That means the population could be segmenting to those, some get start with ESG, some starts with medication, because the value proposition uh, are, are different, but overlapping for these interventions. Then you could then you could graduate from one strategy to another. So we're going to have this sandwiching approach, but no longer we should view ESG as secondary or second line after medication. It could be first line therapy with medications to allow increased access or more patients to get the intervention. And that is the first value proposition. Medications are getting better, no doubt. ESG is getting surfer, sur safer, and now there is there's overlapping and different value proposition to each strategy, but both of them could be first line strategies. And the future then is, is their value of these combinations. And that's where I'm gonna spend the last couple of minutes, is what about combining ESG with these modern uh, medications that are quite effective to Abstracts in Digestive Disease Week, one coming from our group with about 1,500 patients. This is involving multi-centers in the U.S. And though the numbers are small in the, in the number of patients who got concurrent medications, but you could see that the combination with GLP-1 agonist, appetite suppressants, now are pushing that weight loss to uh, about 19% at the two years uh, horizon. A similar study uh, comes from Dr. Uh, Thompson and group at the Brigham and Women Hospital, where in 224 patients in a single U.S. site, showing that the combination of ESG with a GLP-1 receptor agonist reached about 24% total body weight loss, and that was a dominant strategy. Combination of ESG plus non-GLP-1 also had significant weight loss at 18%. ESG alone about 17%. Sequential therapy did a little bit less, but these are patients that were not respond non responders to begin with. So to uh, uh, to conclude my talk, ESG is safe and effective for class one and class two obesity. That's based on level one B and two A evidence. The state of the literature is quite clear. There's evolving evidence in patients with class three obesity, and it's on label. Uh, in the United States to use ESG in patients with uh, body mass index up to 50. ESG has unique value proposition for obesity care that could position it as a frontline therapy along with medications and with surgery and other intervention. And it can be combined with medication or other endoscopic bariatric or metabolic therapy in order to uh, allow uh, treatment for a wider spectrum of disease and, and to tackle uh, uh, more severe cases of uh, obesity and to enhance the durability and the effectiveness of the intervention. With that, I put the plug to see you all in beautiful Naples, uh, in Napoli 23, EPSO. We're going to have a, a good program about ESG and other endoscopic bariatric and metabolic therapy, and I'm looking forward to seeing all of you there. Uh, with gratitude for the uh, organizer for putting this webinar together and happy to, to entertain questions during the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Abudaya. That was a very, very nice presentation. And um, we, we are going to delay uh, questions to the end um, after the presentation from Professor Kahtani. And um, so the next presentation is going to be from uh, Professor uh, Aida Al Kahtani. Um, he, um, if you read the literature, he, he um, published some of the largest series about ESG, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from him here. Thank you. Thank you, Ozar. Uh, please give me the video uh, access, because I don't think they are allowing us uh, from your side, uh, Stefania.
Stephanie, can you allow the video, please? You see the slide? Yes, I see it. You, you just have to launch it. Excellent. But just to allow the video from your side as well. Eh? Your host is uh, blocking the video just for your... Okay, great. So thank you so much uh, for the invitation and it's really a pleasure to be with you here today. And I'm sure uh, Barham has done an excellent job to talk about science behind this. So we will go more for clinical implications and, and community utilization. Um, as you can see, the obesity is really growing, as has been also shown by uh, Barham, and we can expect we are dealing with 2 billion adults and children suffering from obesity of BMI more than 30. And we have multiple um, options nowadays in our hand, bariatric surgery, endobariatric, pharmacological, and lifestyle. And the position of bariatric surgery will be in that category, as I will see. And for bariatric surgery, as has been shown, and um, we know uh, it is the best option in our hand. And I am a surgeon, I'm talking uh, uh, surgical language. Barham is endoscopist and talking from endoscopics uh, like uh, language. But when we come dealing with obesity, we'll, we'll talk almost the same language together. So obesity definitely the most effective, and but the community is not really offering uh, and not really accessing this opportunity. Only one person we can see and this and most commonly sleep gastrectomy and other procedure. And unfortunately, if you look to these cases, you will find that it's only uh, one to two percent who are accessing this for multiple reasons. There are multifactorial, one of them access to care, one of them fear of surgery, the other, there are a lot of uh, causes for this. Children, unfortunately, and pediatric age group is the same. They are not uh, really accessing bariatric surgery less than 0.04% are eligible for uh, or accessing when they are eligible for bariatric surgery. So there is a huge gap. And the gap, as you can see, based on BMI, if you look to those from overweight, 27 uh, BMI to 35, there is no much of solution that will say, let us offer it directly to the patient as a primary therapy and say, well, this is the best option in your case till recently. There is a patient who will be really fearing bariatric surgery or not able to access bariatric surgery. So what we do for this group? There are patients who are completely agonists going for surgery. They would like to have less and minimally invasive procedure. There are patients who are really under or they have some contraindication of bariatric surgery. And there are patients, of course, in different age group like children and adolescents and those with weight regain. So there is a huge gap in addition to being unable to access bariatric surgery, but there is a gap, they're not yet candidate for bariatric surgery or have some issue with bariatric surgery, what should we do for this group? So I think we should can position bariatric uh, endo, endobariatric and ESG in particular to cover this gap. And we will we'll talk how would you cover it. And this is why you see bariatric surgery or endobariatric growing worldwide. We'll see every center is doing it and the leaders worldwide, you can see most of them in this slide. And this is why we have more than 40 cases done currently uh, ESG on the, uh, around the globe. And there are more than 20, 200 publications and more than maybe 15 uh, cases included in this publication with a randomized study as uh, Barham uh, explained. So if you good, where do you put, really put it and what cases will be offered bariatric or ESG? You can offer it as a primary procedure, as you can see here. You can offer it as a combined therapy, ESG plus pharmacotherapy. You can offer it as a revisional, post SG, post bypass, post band, post biliopancreatic, any type of bariatric surgery, you can offer them ESG. You can manage complication. You can combine it with other procedure. You can combine it with fantablication, transoral incisionless fantablications. 
And this is a, a, a recent type of approach. We will say it's very good to offer it for somebody with reflux and would like to lose weight. In addition to other, um, I'm sure there will be more and more will come in the picture for the switching techniques. Unfortunately, in pediatric, you will see most of the people will accept it above 18 years of age. However, there are very few who will suggest above 12 years of age, including which we are included in this group. I think it can be offered above 12 years of age or 10 years of age. And we already, I will show you some study on that. Now for the indication, I can see from 10 years to 65, that's our uh, practice and our recommendation. And I think also in re with regard to BMI, you can offer it from 27 to 35 BMI. That's the ideal patient will say, look, this is your best option. When a patient come to your clinic, you can say, well, I recommend to you this as uh, the best option for your, um, uh, for your weight loss. And we will talk how, uh, why you are selecting that. Now, if somebody failed, uh, non provided that they failed non-invasive uh, um, uh, weight loss, like uh, diet, exercise, and others, and somebody will come to you with BMI more than 35 and say, look, I, am, I don't like bariatric surgery. I don't like to do any intervention. I would like something non-surgical. So that uh, also can be offered. So if you look to FDA, it is also up to 50 BMI, and I don't think the BMI as an upper limit, there is no upper limit. It's a matter of what is the best option to your patient? What is the best option? So I'll say like, less than 35, I will consider ESG. Above 35, surgical intervention is the best scenario. And then of course, revision and procedure. If you look to the FDA as a um, uh, approval study, as you can see uh, uh, again explained by Barham, 30 to 50 BMI are a candidate for this approach or recommended. However, is it the best option? I will say the best option, no. Give it to 30 and even 27 uh, BMI to 35. Those who are not yet candidate for bariatric surgery or maybe it's the best option to lose weight in that group. Would, would you like to offer it for more than that? Sure, but it is, you have to study with your patient. What is their uh, best option? What is their goal? What do they want to achieve by this type of procedure? Contraindication, bleeding disorder, chronic use of, uh, use of anticoagulation, severe or gastric paresis, visual structure, large hiatal hernia more than three centimeter, neoplastic pathology, active peptic ulcer disease, and uncontrolled or untreated psychological disorders like what we have in bariatric surgery. So if you are to create clinical pathway and decision algorithm, you will say, look, I will look to the age and 10 to 65, Currently, if they, it is 18 and above, and uh, we will say, and we are supported by evidence, above 10 years of age can be offered as well. With regard to BMI, if they are less than 35, the best option to go for ESG. If they are more than 35, you discuss with the patient and make a decision. Are they really aiming for like long-term, five years and outcome and uh, really more, uh, uh, emphasis on the procedure itself as the, uh, the maintenance uh, cause uh, of weight loss, then you will consider bariatric surgery. Well, they are refusing bariatric surgery, or they would like to go to less invasive procedure, or they are okay to start with ESG. And at one time, if they are really considering bariatric, it is still a valid option, or they want a reversible procedure. There are a lot of uh, points to be discussed at that level, then definitely ESG is the best option. Uh, then you have to go, this is very important. And I think now we are moving from a stage where we are saying, should we do bariatric, endobariatric or ESG or not? It's not anymore a question to say whether we do ESG or not. ESG is there to stay, ESG is there to, do, to be done. ESG is, must be available in all our practice in our uh, offering to our patient. But how to offer it? What standard of care? What clinical pathway? What uh, 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 perioperative management, that's the most important nowadays. So we should work our patient in some sort of uh, standard care, like preoperative workup. Preoperative, you ask them to be clear liquid the diet before, the night, day before and fasting eight hours. We stop um, any GLP agonist or so uh, about seven days. The, the problem is gastric stasis and maybe you'll find some food in the stomach. So it's better to stop it earlier 
and give them some medication to prepare their stomach. Uh, on the day of surgery, on the holding area, you prepare them with the rehydration, um, VPI, you can give it the night before, antibiotic, antiemetic. You give them also the uroroutine, analgesia and anesthesia medication, post-op also. And then you discharge with a standard protocol. These are the medication that we charge our uh, discharge our patients, good analgesia, good antiemetic, and PPI and uh, sacral fate or other type to help uh, to not to have any gastritis or so after the surgery and antibiotic. Again, antibiotic is not evidence-based, honestly. Most people will give it three days. We give it for three to five days. You can omit it. You can give only the prophylactic dose, preoperative and postoperative three doses, or even one dose pre-op. There is no evidence on that. Now, I think you can understand here, now there are some group also we can offer to this procedure, but yet pediatric, as we have explained, we can offer it super obese patient who cannot do bariatric surgery for whatever reason. And for those who are um, overweight, now overweight, be in mind, less than 30, uh, very few um, uh, cases uh, done till now, but these are our, our experience, 656 cases, then today, they have some people who have been three years on wards, and the weight loss is 13% total weight loss. Remember, we are talking about very low weight to start with, and 13% total weight loss is significant for these cases. And most of them, they have very good quality of life, and they are happy with their procedure afterwards. So it's very good also in overweight. It can be, it has been also studied with some few cases in this area, like class one, class two, as again, as Barham mentioned, it is more effective maybe in the cl higher class, but is it the best option? This is another scenario, especially more than 35, you have to study. You can offer it, you, should, you will be able to give it, and there is no contraindication for that, but you are looking for the uh, outcome-based, long-term outcome and significant weight loss outcome after five years or so. So I will say we will position it, as I said, between 30 and 35 and offer weight as well, 27. Now, this is a case also, this is give you a scenario of a case where she had a band that has penetrated and has been removed. She had attempted a sleeve gastrectomy and they were uh, they converted to laparoscopic to open. They were not able to do it, so they aborted the surgery. In this case, nobody will go to the abdomen anymore and 52 BMI, so ESG was offered for this case. So yes, you will find some cases in the, in the extreme that this is very good solution for them. Again, this has been published 24 cases with super obesity, like BMI with uh, uh, 50 uh, BMI and above. This is a good solution for these cases. Pediatric, we have created algorithm also for bariatric, pediatric patient. And this is the case that we published in uh, uh, American Journal of Gastroenterology. Currently, we have 227 children and adolescents who underwent the procedure with almost 18% um, total weight loss at four years. Uh, how is it compared to other intervention? You compare it to LSE, and very simple. This uh, study uh, at three years, comparing 3,000 patient LSG, and 3,000, currently it's 3,500, but the study was uh, 3,000 plus ESG plus LSG. And in that case, uh, we are saying, how far is it from LSG weight loss? It is within 10% total weight loss of bariatric surgery, of LSG and others. So if you look to compare it, if LSG losing 25%, you will find ESG 15%. If it's losing 30% total weight loss, ESG will lose uh, um, uh, 20%. So this is where we are positioning. In terms of comor comorbidity resolution, there is no significant difference. Uh, maybe diabetes is more definitely LSG, but again, hypertension and dyslipidemia is not very different. Adverse event is, as it's shown, it's very low and very safe procedure. And the beauty of it, you can convert it to LSG, you can repeat it, you can reverse it, you can do anything with the, with the ESG. Uh, study other people have compared it to other procedures and exactly it's lying within 10% of bariatric surgery, within 10% of LSG, within 10% of LSG, and within 10% of, uh, sorry, of uh, uh, application. Again, this is another comparing with this. So, Revisional, yes, it's very important tools in your hand and in your practice as a bariatric surgeon, as endoscopist as well. You can revise bypass, you can revise sleeve, you can revise banding. 
Again, this is a, a, a video to show if you are having a patient post sleep, you can go there and evaluate, and then you start your sleep uh, switching. And I will show you how it looks. Similar, exactly, you go and tighten the whole lumen, sorry. And you go and tighten the whole lumen here. And this is the, the way you look at it. You will see the stomach is very small. After almost 50% of the size you started with. So you are evaluating, going aside to the bilorus, coming backward, and that's what you get after LSG, reduced by 50% the, the, the size of this. This study has been published with our group from Mayo Clinic and other uh, international centers. And again, you can achieve more than 10% total weight loss if you do it after LSG. Again, I tell my patient, you expect to lose 10 kilogram if I offer you ESG after LSG. It's not as effective in a primary, but it is good tools for somebody who would like to lose 10% or 12% of their total weight loss, uh, total body weight after LSG. Unfortunately, you know, revision in, in LSG is very frequent. 10% of LSG will require revision for weight loss or gain. And for that, you will have a huge number of patients in your hand. You can offer them LSG to revise and tell them you will expect 10 kilogram or maybe 10% total weight loss. Again, as I said, the beauty you can revise it to. This is a patient post ESG. You can simply go with the horoscope. You, move, you remove all these adhesions. You remove all these adhesion as you can see here. And then you start your dissection. After that, you occlude the DDNM because this is very important. So you can have, have access to, to, and many people are asking me, how do you do sleep after ASD? Simply as you can see in this video. And you go with the scope after occluding the DDNM, you remove the switchers. Some of them will be still holding. Some of them are loose. This is the anchors. You remove it, you cut it, bullet and cut it. You can might be some needles there, remove, cut it. So you have your stomach straight. There is nothing inside. You will not be worried about to fire on some anchors or needles, and you do standard sleep, as, as you've seen here, safe and standard. Now, this is again a patient with both span. So you can see, you can examine with your um, uh, scope. This is the stoma you are passing. Def make sure you deflate the band. You see it, and then you load your system, and you go again, you pass through the stoma again here, and you create your assembly again as you are doing it in a primary procedure. So there is no, you can leave the band in place, you can remove the band, it's your choice with your patient decision making, but it's safe to do it after band with deflating the stoma or the band. And it's exactly the same. You do it as uh, I do square patterns. Some people do uh, like a U shape, it's all the same. And this is how it looks after doing your procedure. You can do it also after, um, uh, you, this is a revision. This is a patient who had um, primary ESG. So again, you can go and do the switchering. It's, you don't need to cut all suture inside. Those who are interfering with you, you see some of them are still holding, leave them, they are helping you, no problem. Unless the patient is complaining of pain or anything that you think the suture is the cause of that. But otherwise, you create another uh, rose on to, to retighten the stomach. See this, it's in our way, so we removed it. We think it's not helping and it is confusing the, the procedure, so you remove it from your way. You might see some uh, anchors or needles, you remove them. Otherwise, you continue the same technique and it is until it's done fully and finally completed. Again, you look at it from the bilateral. We put some antibiotics, not always necessary. We don't put it anymore. And this is redo ESG. Again, you can use it in fistula. This is a video to show you, but I will not uh, have it for the sake of time. But in general, 
you can look and evaluate your fistula. And afterward, you go and this is the fistula down here and uh, at six o'clock position. And you can go beyond the fistula and try to uh, switch it from distal proximal, take good bite, multiple, uh, maybe one or two. Sometimes one is more than enough. And you will close your fistula after LSG. You can combine it with TIF. This is a patient with reflux and would like to lose weight. So you pass your, uh, those who are familiar with the procedure, you pass your uh, system and then you control. This is where you, you have your uh, anti-reflux uh, techniques. You will end by having a very nice uh, wrap, as you can see here, endoscopic uh, transoral endosco incisionless uh, fund duplication. That's the wrap. And then you start your ESG. And this is how it looks after the procedure. So in conclusion, it serves as a middle ground solution between lifestyle behavior modification, anti-obesity medication, or combined and bariatric surgery. Uh, it fills very important critical gap for those who are not yet eligible for bariatric surgery, or they are fearful of bariatric surgery, and those who have contraindication for bariatric surgery. Children and adolescents who suffer from severe obesity should be referred to multidisciplinary team and think should be offered also in the bariatric procedure. ESG should be offered in multidisciplinary team. This is very critical because if you offer it in, in a practice that has no clue about obesity management, you will not be successful. You will not be, you must be in that type of format. And then you must, you must it is time now to standardize the technique and clinical pathway for our clinical practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor al Kahtani. Uh, wonderful presentation. I cannot agree more. Uh, all management of, of uh, patients with obesity should be in a multidisciplinary fashion, and we need all the element of the multidisciplinary team to be involved in the management of people with obesity. Um, I, um, in, in regards to any bariatric procedure, clearly, uh, it's very important for us to have a, a very good safety profile. Um, and one of the uh, biggest reviews written about ESG um, reported adverse event at 2.2%, um, a study by uh, Dr. Hijoji, and I, I think uh, Dr. Abudaya is one of the co-authors, co um, and peri perigastric leak at 0.48%. Uh, pain or nausea requiring admission at 1.08%, uh, upper GI bleed 0.56%. And I, I would like to ask the panel about their views in regards to, to the safety of the ESG. Uh, Dr. Cohen, um, what, what are your thoughts about the safety profile of the ESG? Actually, uh, before jumping on the safety, I believe that we are living in an exciting era for the treatment of obesity. Because we have, uh, I'm a pure metabolic and bariatric surgeon. And what I see is that with the new pharmacotherapy, with the new minimal invasive approaches like endoscopy, uh, we can widen the indications for the treatment for those patients. And in my point of view, I've discussed this with Barham several times, et cetera. We are in the verge of developing uh, a state-of-the-art new technique through the endoscope to promote more access to patients. It's like lifestyle interventions. We know that two out of, out of uh, 10 will be successful long-term. However, if you put them in the bundle of care of obesity and all the associated diseases, those people, they are not any more blamed for their disease because they are involved in the care of them. So if they have a safe approach like the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. If they have a safer approach combining both, as Barham showed, and then they do not respond to this. They have, I don't like to call them non-responders, but they have a suboptimal response. Then combining those, 
It's the best medical treatment available. And then even then they fail. They not they are suboptimal responders. We can jump into surgery with much more background to tell them, yes, it's a chronic and progressive disease. So I think it's a very exciting time to be here. It's drugs are working well. New drugs in the pipeline will work much better. Endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty is being mature right now. It's not anymore like five years ago when we had no evidence to support it. Now we do have them, even level one evidence. So I think that, yes, it's a safe approach that will fill a gap to patients that have not surgical indication, like an academic one, like a formal one. And those patients who don't like to, they don't like to, they don't like surgery or they're afraid of surgery or whatever uh, reason, they can do safely endoscopic sleep gastroplasty. And I firmly believe that drugs plus uh, ESG will be uh, the future of the first step into the medical care of obesity and all associated diseases. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Moore, any, any views about the safety of, of the ESG? You keep trying to get us back to safety and we're all holding other questions. <laughs> I, think, I think ESG has proven worldwide with big numbers that it is quite safe. Um, and uh, if I were a patient with obesity, it would be common sense to choose you know, the safest thing. And if I could get my disease under control with that, then, you know, that would be great. So if, if I were a patient, I would start with anti-obesity medications and then perhaps an endoluminal therapy. And, and you know, I'm of course very comfortable with bariatric surgery if, if you know, if it was necessary to, to progress. And I think, I think that's the way things are going to go. Um, I had a question for um, uh, Barham. I, I know you work at a, you know, wonderful center that has um, medical obesity specialists, uh, you know, endoscopists and uh, great surgeons who are my dear friends. How does the program choose what treatment course an individual patient is going to pursue? Thank you, Dr. Moore. That's a wonderful question. And that's that's an evolving topic. Uh, here, we we offer the patients all the options. We know that there's different factors why patients gravitate to one strategy versus the other. And instead of saying we have a pyramid, we should gravitate toward these pillars of therapy because there's psychosocial determinant, there's what's covered, there's what's the patient preference, and all are factors into the patient decision-making. So we offer all the spectrum, and we counsel the patient that they're a better candidate for one strategy versus the other, but ultimately it's shared decision-making. Uh, since we all are uh, salaried, this discussion becomes much easy because the, the needs of the patient come first. So we offer the patient the best therapy that fits their lifestyle, fits their choices, and is safe and effective. And it's a fluid spectrum. If you do not respond to one strategy, and we know it's, it's variable response to any strategy, uh, then you go to the to the to the other strategy, and we keep uh, augmenting the spectrum of care to allow for a durable and and effective clinical response in the mid to long term. Who does that counseling? It's the physician, whether it's a, a GI or a surgeon, whoever the patient happens to bump into first. Actually, we have a program called Start Point, so they don't bump bump into the uh, gastroenterologist or the surgeon. They bump into somebody who is a medical specialist in the treatment of obesity. Uh, they they give them the the Start Point, which is all the options that they qualify for. They have a chance to ask questions and get clarification. Some people come with the mindset that they want one particular intervention versus the other, and then it's a dialogue. And then the patient gets the intervention that's personalized to their needs. And that's what we're going to see. We like to live into this world that we're going to have access to everything. We might have access to, to everything, but in reality, the population is huge and will need to be segmented to one strategy or the other because it's not one cap fits all when it comes to what's your first choice for the treatment. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, Dr. Al-Faris, um, from your point of view as, as a, a bariatric physician, and what, where do you see uh, the ESG in, in terms of your algorithm of uh, treating people with obesity? 
So I'm going to be the devil's advocate here as an endocrinologist and an obesity medicine physician. Um, when we talk about ESG, what worries me about it is that it doesn't have any metabolic benefits. And when I say metabolic benefits, I talk about changes in ghrelin and changes um, in incretins. Um, microbiome, probably we will see changes in microbiome with endoscopic gastroplasty just because of how the procedure is, is being done. But those very robust changes that we see with metabolic surgery, we do not have the data yet that shows us that we are going that we are seeing them with endoscopic gastroplasty. Uh, as far as I know, uh, we don't we do not see changes um, in ghrelin, which is a good thing. Ghrelin doesn't go up post endoscopic gastroplasty, but as well, we do not see any changes in incretins, either GLP ones, PYY. I think there's also data on GIP. Um, and, and those things tend to worry me. And that's probably why you don't see a lot of, of diabetes um, um, remission as much uh, with endoscopic uh, gastroplasty as compared to a procedure such as sleeve gastrectomy. Um, so, so that's one thing that worries me. When we talk about uh, as well the um, era of, of pharmacotherapy, it becomes... Uh, you, Probably pharmacotherapy now, no matter what you know, the studies show about 33% of individuals who take a drug like tercipatide uh, will, in the surmount one trials, will probably lose um, about 20% of their weight, which is very, very close to what endoscopic gastroplasty shows. Um, is it? Um, but but the others, you know, the other 66% will probably lose much less weight. Um, time, time will only tell. Terzipatide, for instance, is still not uh, approved by the FDA uh, to um, treat obesity as of this, but we're expecting, you know, an approval to come any time by the end of this year. Um, so, so, and 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 coming back to that, if you look at the the new ISO ASMBS guidelines on bariatric surgery, they have lowered the threshold to thirty BMI of thirty. And the reason is because of the metabolic benefits of bariatric surgery that we don't see with other interventions, either it's pharmacotherapy or endoscopic gastroplasty. The changes we see with endoscopic gastroplasty, the changes that Dr. Abulaya beautifully showed is because of weight loss. So those patients who lose weight will probably have better hemoglobin A1Cs, will have um, better lipid profiles, Probably their blood pressure will go down, but on the long run, will we see that cancer prevention um, effect? Will we see that um, increase in in life um, in you know in lifetime in years? Um, I, I'm not sure about that. So, will I be sending my patients to do endoscopic gastroplasty? Of course, I will, because as everyone on this panel said, that we we do tailor our treatment to our patients. But if I have a patient with, um, for instance, type 2 diabetes sitting in my office um, with a VMI of 30, I would definitely recommend metabolic surgery rather than an endoscopic gastroplasty because I am not interested in the weight loss as much. I'm interested in benefits beyond weight loss. Thank you very much, Dr. Al-Faris. Very, very good answer. Um, Dr. Abudaya. I, I think you published something about uh, hormones like 12 months after ESG. I, I, am I right to think that uh, GLB-1 increases um, after ESG? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zaha, for that question. I, I tend to take a little bit of a different approach to this question because we, we know that a lot of the weight loss that we observe with GLP-based therapies is related to a delay in gastric emptying. That means you remove the delay in gastric emptying, the dependent effect is still uh, limited and not well understood. So, and based on the bariatric surgery literature, we still do not have a good scientific story to say that correlation with the hormone levels correlate with any heart endpoint. That means GLP-1 level did not correlate with percentage of remission of type 2 diabetes. 
So, so the the and these hormones are not designed physiologically to be in the in, in in the blood circulation. They're designed to work on the local paracrine enteric nervous system circulation. That's why we have DTP4, which are enzymes that break them in the circulation. So all that leads me to think that we need to focus more on the heart outcomes and how the outcomes are glycemic control macro and micro uh, vascular complications, mortality and morbidity. We still do not have mortality and morbidity data on ESG, but this time we'll, we'll, we'll develop that story. But to put our eggs on a hormonal basket, I, I don't think the field have gone there because they do not correlate with hard clinical endpoints at this point. I may comment also on this, uh, on uh, Alfaris uh, Nasreen. I think um, she has very good point in terms of, we are not saying here it's a replacement for bariatric surgery and we should not compare it to bariatric surgery as head to head, no way. We are in agreement that AST is very good for those who are not candidate for bariatric surgery or are refusing bariatric surgery, but it will not definitely will not give you the outcome bariatric surgery. So, and there are many patients in our practice. First of all, there is a huge gap to require this intervention. Second, there are patients in our practice who come and say, I don't like to go for bariatric surgery, or they are not yet candidate for bariatric surgery. I agree also between 30 and 35, if they have severe comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, sure, with the changing the new guidelines that we can offer bariatric surgery 30 and above, yes, that's the, the, the uh, t intervention that can give a very long-term outcome, 10 years and more, and good resolution of comorbidity and so on and so forth. However, we have shown in our study three years outcome of ESG in diabetes, 60% resolution. So yes, it's effective in comorbidity resolution. Yes, it's effective in uh, well, uh, NASH and others. But again, uh, the, our mistake if we start comparing it head to head to bariatric surgery, it is a very important effective solution for a huge group that are not in that category of bariatric surgery or not candidate for bariatric surgery for whatever reason. Barham, you know what I would suggest? Maybe this is the answer that Nas Nasrim and all the endocrinologists that I, I have a lot of contact with them because of metabolic surgery. If you, we don't know what's the add-on effect of ESG over the drugs. So if you look at a, a randomized control trial with ESG, ESG plus terzepatide, uh, a double mm -hmm. analog, and, and terzepatide alone, we can we can disclose the effects of ESG yes. over metabolic control. So I think that's the key. And then and then and then start thinking on microvascular complications. Well, uh, we, we we have a plain and clean field to progress with, with ESG. So terzepatine, ESG plus terzepatine, and and terzepatine alone probably. Nasrin will be happy to see, yes. Very uh, happy, yes. Uh, I would love to see hectic trials like wherever that. Wherever I speak on that, it's the same thing. So we're doing this with surgery right now. We ran a randomized control trial to see if surgery plus terzepatide is better than surgery alone in patients who fail to some megalotide. So it's it's interesting. This is, a, this is the way to go, uh, Barham, and I think you have the power to do this. I completely agree. And the message here is a message that it's, this progress that we're seeing is highly uh, uh, appealing and should be celebrated because to the in the first time in history, we're seeing progress in the field of excess adiposity. Innovations will continue to evolve and our job is to, to administer them and to introduce them in a safe manner to clinical practice. And I think uh, I think more studies need to be done head to head completely to see the added value of one strategy versus the other. Because at the end of the day, it's going to be ways to manage the patient and give multiple options for the patient. So all of this is to be celebrated. And I think the field is going in the right direction. And we should congratulate everybody who worked in that field and continue to push forward. Because 300 options without access is nothing. That's right. And yes. well, I will I will add some argument for this one. I mean, there are some I'm um, with medical treatment and the obesity medication, especially Monjaros and others, uh, with the with the effective twenty percent plus. But uh, how many patients will be regaining their weight? More than seventy percent if they stop their medication. That has been shown. Second. Yeah, but they're not supposed to stop their medication, right? So I, I don't like arguing the fact of I agree, stopping. I agree. 
let us look at to all together. I'm not saying I'm not against it, but let us put uh, all things together and, and discuss now. So we are saying, yes, they will regain if they stop. So they should continue. Now, what is the cost for the continuation of three, four years? It's a huge cost. So, so Dr. Again, I, have, I am not arguing cost effectiveness of medications because I would be lying if medications as of now are not cost effective at all. Maybe in 10 years, yes. But as of now, nothing, if you're going to talk about cost effectiveness, nothing is as cost effective as bariatric surgery. Absolutely. It is the most cost effective way. Sure. And the most effective way. That is why a very, you know, I'm very big proponent of, of metabolic surgery as opposed to any other form of, of uh, weight loss or, or treatment of obesity, to, to be exact. Um, and as I said, I am not... A patient, Nisreen, if you are a patient coming to the clinic and saying, you have to pay, for example, double what you are saying, and day and weekly you are taking uh, terzabatide for a period of three years, or I'll give you ESG, and for three years, you're not worried about, I mean, you will worry, you have to be in a uh, diet and others as, as the same as uh, anti-obesity medication, but you will not be worried about this and compliance and hangers after stopping the medication and so on and so forth. What would you choose? No, I completely, I completely agree with you. These things are are completely tailored by by um, the doctor and the patient, um, you know, discussion and agreement. And that's why I said when I, when I what when I was talking, I said, will I be sending my patients for the procedures? Definitely, I will be sending my patients for the procedure because the same issues that I talked about with endoscopic gastroplasty, we we have them in medications. I do not know what's going to happen in 10 or 15 years after using medications. Is it going to have a, a, an effect on mortality and or, or so? We don't know. We don't have the medications are all new. Either it be semaglutide, liraglutide, um, terzepatide. They're very new, and we still do not have that data. I only have data on metabolic surgery. Yeah, we need to move on with science behind ESG plus medications versus medications. And, and in people with diabetes, because they lose less weight with terzepatide and semaglutide than people without diabetes and only obesity. So I think, yes. I think that's the way to go. And with bariatric surgery as well, right? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. They don't lose as much weight. That's why we're combining therapies, even with... With, with surgery. So this is, it's not the future, it's the present. Yeah. Great. Okay. Can, can, can I just ask a question which is slightly different from what we spoke about so far? And it, it clearly, patients with obesity should be at the center of, of management, of, of, of their management. And I heard a lot about people who don't want bariatric surgery, who might opt for ESG. It, is there evidence for that? Um, or is all of this anecdotal? Well, uh, to me, I gravitate to the most data that we have is that the most effective and durable intervention that changes the morbidity and mortality for the patient is bariatric surgery. So if you have a patient who qualifies for bariatric surgery, your first line counseling should be to get bariatric surgery. But the fact or the numbers talk to themselves that 90 plus percent of the patients are not opting for that as a first line intervention. In the absence of that, we have now therapies that, that could uh, augment that spectrum of care to increase that access to patients to a wider segment of the population. So I think that's the value proposition, how these are gonna be, and these interventions do not burn the bridge for bariatric surgery. That means some people might lose the weight and keep it off, then that's a success. Some people might lose the weight, regain it, they graduate to bariatric surgery. Some people might lose the weight, gain some, go to medications, but, in cardiovascular medicine, we learned one simple lesson is that the patient prefer not to lose their anatomy. And that is an important principle. So anatomy preservation is important. And I think the next wave of what you're gonna see in bariatric surgery is laparoscopic procedures that are geared towards preserving the anatomy. So we're gonna see these hybrid procedures and all that are advancement and innovation to utilize the GI tract as a therapeutic target because we know that's the right target is the gastrointestinal term. Thank you. And uh, one question which came through uh, our question and answers. Um, 
people compare ESG to gastric plication. Um, and as we know, gastric plication is, is out of favor at the moment. W what are your views about gastric plication versus ESG? And why do you think ESG might be more durable than gastric plication? I can answer this, uh, uh, Zahar. Uh, first of all, I don't think we should compare it. First of all, the laparoscopic plication is a surgical procedure. You need to defascularize the stomach, as you know, and we have to plicate it. And we know how difficult is the revision after uh, plication. Okay. You have to undo it in most of the cases. Uh, very rarely you will be able to do sleeve or uh, uh, other procedure unless you undo it, and it's not easy to undo it. And it, uh, we have done that cases, and we, 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 the, we know the challenge in these cases. So this is one. Second, the, the, the good things about uh, ESG, it's uh, reversible. It can be done uh, twice or whatever you need. And again, the reversal to another procedure is easy. In terms of durability, it is, I wouldn't say it is better than uh, uh, laparoscopic application or worse or uh, in another way. But I will say the most important difference between the two procedures, it's less invasive and it is easy to reverse or undo at any time you would like to do. But Zahar, I would make a point here, and we tend to ignore physiology in the midst of all of this. The stomach is highly innervated by vagal afferents, highly. That's why in, in a physiological system, human appetite is a process of accommodation and emptying of the stomach. That's how we terminate the meal and how that's we go through the intermeal intervals. When so you're not comparing apples to apples. With the greater curvature application, you are denervating the greater curvature of the stomach as a first step of that procedure and devascularizing it. So the system is no longer physiologic. So I think the mechanism of action is quite different between these two interventions. Great. Th th thank you very much. Um, any final comments from the panel before we wrap up? I have there one more question. I have one more quick question for Dr. Al-Khatani. Um, and the timing of the, if you were going to do a revision on a patient that had had a previous ESG and cut the sutures, do you do that endoscopy same day as your surgery or another day? Uh, you mean same day in terms of laparoscopic, if I do another procedure at the same time? I mean, if you're going to, if you're planning to do a revision, you're gonna cut out your ESG in preparation to do a revision, okay. do, you, do you do that on the same day as your surgery or do you do it beforehand on another I, day? I do it on that, but look, we can revise ESG to another ESG. So again, you go there and switch are automatic. If you revise it to laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, we do it on the same day and same time. So we finish the mobilization of the stomach, we occlude the duodenum so we don't have inflation of the gas in the small bowel, and we remove the switcher, it take maybe five minutes or 10 minutes to just remove whatever you see in your eyes, and you apply the, the technique. So yes, on the same day, same uh, same time. Thank you. do you. the same thing, Rachel, you do the same thing as well. Do you? Oh, Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I think the final words are here is, uh, Barham convinced me that we have evidence right now because we had a lot of arguments in the past, but now I, we do agree that, that adding access to patients, it's the way to go because the more the options, the more patients will be treated. And, and I agree hundred percent with Nasreen. Uh, the way to go is to disclose the effects of, if, of each uh, uh, op therapeutic option. So I think uh, surgical innovations is here to stay either uh, surgical, what I mean by surgery or endoscopy, mm -hmm. that it's a state of the art technology to improve uh, the outcomes of our patients. And thanks Ipsa for, for this uh, webinar. It's very important to spread, spread the knowledge all over the world. Thank you. Nasreen, anything from you? Uh, just that I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that this um, webinar is happening and um, there's a lot of confusion about endoscopic gastroplasty and what it does and, and how effective it is. And I'm really, really happy that we have options, as Dr. Cohen said, but I really think that the way to going forward, again, is as what Dr. Cohen said, is really combination therapy. So when I look at these procedures, I always look at them as an add-on to metabolic surgery and pharmacotherapy or add-ons to pharmacotherapy, um, less likely as standalone, either in the long term or the or the in the short term or the long term. I always look at uh, the idea of combination therapy as the way to go.
that, that, that's great. Th thank you very much. I would say Sorry. that just uh, to emphasize the multidisciplinary team, the standardize of care, I think we should be moving forward, what should be the very operative management in general, what should be the technique and maybe standardize the technique. This is to get a better outcome. There are some question I can see in the question and answer in terms of why we are calling it the discovic sleeve gastroblasty, why we are adding the, adding the word sleeve to the, to the thing. I said it's, uh, uh, it's misleading uh, in general, but again, it is sleeve-like. So you can accept this terms being sleeve-like, but again, we are not saying it's a replacement for bariatric or sleeve gastrectomy. It is an option or uh, that can be offered for some group of patient. And in terms of comorbidity, there is another question, how far you can go on comorbidity? Any comorbidity, diabetes, hypertension can be offered. The, we've shown the result in each comorbidity. What is the expectation in comparing to sleep? And it, can, it, it is definitely effective in all comorbidities uh, with, uh, of obesity. Thank you. Baram, last word. Well, last word is uh, Dr. Cohen is, is a scholar who evaluates the literature and, and get a new appraisal. And that's the approach that we should take. We should keep an open mind, wait until the literature evolve, make conclusions that are in the best interest of our patients. And that applies to any intervention that we're going to em uh, embrace. So the, the, these are my departing thoughts, is keep an open mind, embrace innovation, and ask for more literature, because that's how we advance the science. That, that's great. That's a, a, a very good end to, to this webinar. And just to add, what, what I was really impressed with in, in all of this conversation is how every one of, of uh, the, the panel and the presenters had the patient at the center of, of their management of, of um, uh, people with obesity. So patient-centered approach, tailored approach to patients' needs, multidisciplinary approach, and all built on evidence. That's um, really what, what we want to achieve with in management of people with obesity. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Uh, thank you, Prof. Kahtani and uh, Prof. Abudaya for, for uh, your presentations, really uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, thank you for the panel, Dr. Cohen, uh, Dr. Moore, Dr. Alfaris, um, and thank you for uh, all uh, the, the audience. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, most of the questions were answered during the presentations. Uh, I'm certain um, the panel and the presenters will be very happy to interact with you um, on um, different uh, social media platforms to, to answer your questions. Um, lovely to see you all. Have, have a wonderful day. And uh, thank you again for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.